She is the star of a serial that's taken the country by storm. For a year, if not more, it's held us in its thrall. We all know what she's like on screen, but what is she like in person? Well, here's your chance to find out as I introduce you to Smriti Malhotra. Welcome to the program, Smriti, or should I say, Tulsi Bhabi. <laughs> Thanks, Karun. How often do you get mistaken for your screen role, and when it happens, are you pleased or irritated? Well, uh, people know me more as Tulsi than Smriti. You're one of the rare ones who actually knows my name. <laughs> but when I do get called uh, Tulsi Bhabi on the streets, it's a compliment for me as an actor. That means I'm doing my job well. You know, I you don't get that irritated by it. <laughs> you dominate the serial, and yet the amazing thing is, I'm told, that there were loads of people who kept saying to Ekta she was making a terrible mistake. That's true. I had um, a confession from the writers of the serial who said we ran to Ekta. We told her, if you're casting this girl, you're making a big mistake. <laughs> Change your decision now. And uh, thankfully, uh, Ekta was firm. What did they think was wrong with you? Well, they had this girl who was wearing her jeans and a t-shirt and glasses and absolutely not interested in flattering anybody or behaving in a filmy style, in a filmy manner, sitting quietly in one corner reading a book, waiting for her turn. Everything that Tulsi isn't on screen. Everything an actress isn't, actually, very honestly speaking. So they, uh, they couldn't believe that this person came here to act. I didn't have an attitude an actor is supposed to have. I didn't have the flair. And uh, I didn't have, uh, I guess, the behavior pattern that comes with a normal Indian actor. In fact, it even happened to you when you went for the audition. I'm told that the lady in charge of the audition had one look at you and wanted to send you back home. Yeah, she said, I said, I've come here to audition for Tulsi. And she just looked at me up and down and she said, I don't think so. <laughs> so <laughs> I was like, but excuse me, could you please look under Tulsi's name? There's a name called Sriti Malhotra. That's me. I've come here for the audition. She wouldn't believe me. She checked the whole book. She couldn't find my name. So I said, please go ahead. Why don't you check on Atulsi? And she gave me one look like, poor soul. She doesn't know what she's in for. She flipped the pages in, right there on the Tulsi. She said, yeah, there's a girl called Sriti. I said, that's me. So she said, yeah? OK, I guess. And then she gave me the script. And that's where the story began. <laughs> you know, it went on to become, and still is, in fact, probably the most successful serial that there's ever been in India. Is it true that Ekta actually predicted this success the day she chose you for the role? Very honestly speaking, the second day of my shoot, Ekta came and met me on the sets. Um, she knew uh, that uh, a lot was riding on the serial. It was the first daily show for Star Plus. It was the first daily show for Balaji. Um, for her, it was a very prestigious project. She had put in all that she could into it. And that's why she was absolutely sure that since she has put in all the hard work and she has selected a good cast, this thing is going to hit the mark. But uh, looking at me, she wasn't that sure whether I understand what was going to happen to me because of the serial. So she came up to me on the set and she said, Sriti, do you know what role you've been given? And for me, it was just another normal role. She said, there's a lot riding on it. And then she explained to me the whole process that she had to go through. I was not overawed. For me, it was uh, this girl who's my age, who's handling such a big company. For her, it was a stepping stone. So I understood where she came from. I understood her fears. I understood her dreams. And uh, for me, it was like, okay, if I can be a part of it, why not? If and my end can make it happen, then why not? And yet the outcome is still quite difficult to understand because when Kyunki happened, it was so different to everything else on television. It emphasizes the strong traditional role of women, not the modern defiant woman. In a strange way, do you think that difference is responsible for its success? My role, as far as, uh, as, far as Tulsi goes, all I can say for that, not for the serial, is that um, I played Tulsi not only as a traditional Indian Bahu, but I also played her uh, as a woman with a modern outlook as well to life. I didn't play her uh, as you would normally see uh, bahus and wives being played on Indian screen, somebody who wouldn't know how to speak English or wouldn't know how to carry herself. I made a determined effort to project Tulsi as somebody who's educated, who knows where she's coming from. And yet is part of tradition. Who's yet traditional. Because I truly believe that uh, women today, no matter how successful a career they have, do make certain compromises do uh, let a lot of things go at home to keep peace at home. And uh, when you know that fact of life, why not bring it on to screen? So in a sense That's why I think really a lot of people identified a lot. And of you were women. projecting a real reality that you sensed was out there? Yes, I did. I did speak to a lot of women. I, I 
noticed a lot of women and the conversations they used to have in either kitty parties or, or sitting together late at night outside in the veranda. I, I would remember conversations uh, my aunts or my neighbors would have with each other about the problems they would face. And I'd remember the advice elderly women would give, uh, you know, a, a newly married girl of uh, how to tackle problems. And I thought this is the way to play the role. It's interesting you should mention that about elderly women. Many people say that the critical relationship in the serial is between you and Ba. Would you accept that? In a way, yes. In a way, yes. Because uh, it is a way of bridging the gap between two generations. Tulsi is the way of uh, bringing about a certain amount of peace between Ba and her daughter-in-law, Savita, of making Ba understand where Savita comes from, making Savita understand what problems Ba must be facing at her age. Uh, what dreams Ba must be having. Um, I've seen uh, a lot of women identify with my sympathies with my relationship with Ba. In fact, I had a lady who was around 60, 55, 60 years old. One Sunday morning, she knocks on my door. She says, um, I am part crippled from my left leg. I'm having some what, of a problem at home with my daughter-in-laws. But what gives me strength is the fact that uh, a Bahu like you could mend ways and uh, bring about peace. So hopefully one day my grandson will marry a girl like you and I'll have peace at home. That for me was like, that's the day I realized, oh God, this thing is really having an impact on people's lives. Amazing. And yet the interesting thing is you never trained as an actress and you mm -hmm. had no experience before you stepped in front of the cameras the first time. None. Were you nervous? No, I was N not. Not even a little bit? No, I was not. I was not at all nervous. The first time I faced a screen for serial was uh, with a, another actor, was with Nina Gulkarni. Uh, I was not nervous. I was more of in awe of Nina because I had seen her work before. For me, she was a senior and uh, I quite liked her acting. So for me, on the same platform as that actress, from, that was quite a shocker. And that's when I realized, okay, you decided to be an actor. Now's the time to, dig, uh, to get serious about it. Uh, apart from that, I was never, never nervous. In you say now is the time to get serious about it. Does that mean you've now had to acquire an attitude so that casting ladies don't look askance at you next time? I camera? still don't have an attitude, unfortunately. <laughs> I still don't have an attitude. In fact, a journalist approached me one day and said, you know, the problem is, Riti, you're brutally honest and you're no-nonsense. You're not at all like an actress is supposed to be. And what did you say? I said, thank you for the compliment. <laughs> Uh, because I like the fact that I don't have a frivolous um, personality. I like the fact that people respect me for my views. Uh, they and you're determined to stay like that as well? Yes, because I think uh, this is just the beginning of my career. Um, it might not be that of an actress five years from now. I might be a writer, an entrepreneur, anything. But for me, it's just a stepping stone. It's not the be all and end all of Sriti. And uh, the fact that uh, it has been the number one show for the past one year and the fact that it's not gone to my head, I think is a good thing. That means I can handle more success. <laughs> In fact, not only handle more success, because side by side you do another TV show where you play a very different role. You're an agony aunt in Janam Samjhakaro. Is that more fun or more demanding? I'm not uh, actually an agony aunt. I'm more of a sounding board for people. A lot of people come on board talking about their relationships, talking about the past, talking about their um, desires for the future, desires from each other. Uh, for me, it's, uh, I'm kind of a sounding board for them. Uh, also, when I see couples who have been married like for 20, 25 years, I see the problems that they have. I see the laughter that they share. There are times when while I'm shooting, I actually think to myself, okay, if I last if my marriage lasts for 25 years and I happen to share so much of happiness from, with my husband, I guess I'd be really lucky. But you know, being a sounding board is not easy. It means you have to be very sympathetic to other people's concerns and interests. Are you naturally a sympathetic person? Um, I would disagree on that, Karan. It's not only sympathetic, being neutral, I think is more important. You mean not if, taking if, sides in their yeah, problem? Yeah, not taking sides. Uh, there are times when, uh, uh, in the middle of a conversation, a wife presumes that being a woman, I would take her side. And I do actually the opposite of it. I tell her that, do you know what? Your husband's right. You're wrong. Do you so, do it sometimes deliberately to try and wake her up and shake her? No, I, I give her the honest truth, which she refuses to see. Because I think uh, two people work at a relationship. Two people keep a relationship going. So it's just because I'm a woman, 
and just because I'm supposed to be Tulsi Bhabi does not mean that uh, you sitting at the opposite end, what you're doing in your relationship would actually be right. If Maybe the poor chap is not at fault for a change. Maybe he needs to be heard. So when people ask you for your advice on Janam Samjha Kuro, do they sort of think they're asking Tulsi rather than Smriti and get shaken when Smriti answers and does so in a way perhaps Tulsi wouldn't have done? I break the image just five minutes into the interview. I they, uh, Honestly speaking, a lot of people do come out to the show thinking they'll be speaking to Tulsi and uh, thinking I'll be speaking in that tone or thinking I'll be speaking uh, with a particular set of ideas in my mind. But five minutes into the conversation, they realize, OK, this is somebody different. So the conversation from there on takes place as if it would take place between three like-minded individuals. It does not take place as if you, there's this actor you're talking to. It takes place as if you're talking to either uh, some friend next door or your neighbor next door. It's Which interesting I think that you should talk about breaking the image within five minutes. Does it ever worry you that because of the success of Kyunki and the powerful personality of Tulsi, you might be typified in people's eyes as a sort of, how would they call it, goody, goody wife? And you See, for um, an actor, what's important is to have, obviously, a variety of roles. I was fortunate enough to begin with comedy, Bakeman Zulala. That's where I was spotted by Shobha Kapoor. Uh, then I went on to a very serious drama series called Atish with Sanjay Upadhyay, where my role was not uh, that of a, I mean, not one of your traditional Bahu's role. I but will moving on from Tulsi be as easy? I don't know. Honestly speaking, I don't know. I don't think uh, I would ever get a negative role to play because I don't think people would ever believe it. Uh, but I might get more positive, more strong roles which project women in a different uh, image altogether. So far you haven't looked for such roles in films, is that deliberate? So far films have not looked at me, very honestly speaking. Uh, because um, I think uh, what the journalist said was true, my behaviour does not welcome a filmmaker to come and sit across the table and talk to me. But you would welcome I, I one if would, he did? I haven't seen anyone yet. I don't think so because my mindset does not agree to that kind of a working pattern. I don't have the patience to listen to how somebody gave break to one legend or how one actress got a job here and that. I don't have the patience for all that. So which is the normal norm in the industry? You give the person opposite you the respect of listening to his history for a good two hours and then get on to your role. And you haven't got the patience I for that. I don't have the patience. Like I say, I'm a no-nonsense human being. So people don't approach me with such stuff. But if they did, and if the role was challenging, you wouldn't necessarily say no. Honestly speaking, now I don't think I'll get a role apart from the goody goody bhabi image. I don't think I'll get anything. A source else of apart. regret? No. I think television today has given me the amount of fame that any actress on the Indian screen would get, uh, which is something quite shocking, but that's the truth. Uh, apart from the fame, what it also has given me is a certain amount of respect among people. Uh, I can walk into any household today and I'll be treated seriously. I'll be treated with a lot of respect. Uh, and I don't want to lose it, very honestly speaking. I don't want to run around trees and have men look at me in a different way. That's as blatant as I can get. Let's take a break. I want to come back and find out what is this lady that in front of me is actually like. You've told me what your like is Tulsi. I want to know what your like is yourself. <laughs> we'll be back in a couple of moments. Stick with us. Welcome back. My guest is Smriti Malhotra. Let's talk about your childhood. I gather you grew up in a family where both your parents worked, and while they were away, you and your sisters tore the place apart. <laughs> yeah, in a way, in a way. We tried to be as disciplined as we could, but um, there was a time after school where we knew our parents would be away at work, and uh, we would utilize to bring it, the house down. And mind you, clean up just half an hour before my mom got home. So mom never really found out until you told her? Till I think one day she took a half day leave and she came home and then the house was in a mess and then she understood what's going to happen is like exactly at 4.30 I ring the alarm and then all the sisters go helter skelter clean up the place and she happened to watch all that and then she's like okay this is what you guys do behind my back. She says that you were a very strong willed and determined young child yeah. and that it was impossible to discipline you. I didn't take a lot of disciplining actually very honestly speaking I was more or less of a loner, very happy with the book. I was not into socializing, not into partying. 
I wouldn't, uh, I think I took my first school trip when I was 16 years old. Uh, since I was a quiet sort, I didn't need to be disciplined a lot. But yeah. Uh, but you weren't <laughs> above getting into scrapes with all the boys in the neighborhood, <laughs> were you? Well, as long as possible, I lied by telling them I fell down somewhere and hit my head somewhere else and fell off a bike somewhere. So they wouldn't know where all the scrapes and all the marks would come from till one day my mom actually witnessed me in a fist fight with a boy. And that's when she knew that, you know, I've been fibbing all along. I believe she was shouting from the balcony, she's a girl, she's a girl. Let her go! <laughs> and for me, that was the biggest insult possible. I'm like, how can you tell him that? It's okay, I can fight to him man to man. So my mom was like, this is not how girls are meant to be. And um, for them, it was, uh, since I didn't project any kind of ambition, for my parents, uh, the only ambition in, in life I was supposed to have was that to be married off to one settled boy in London and all that. So for her, it was very essential for her to drill the fact home that this is not how girls behave. Girls are supposed to cook food and look after the house front and everything. And you weren't going to have any of that? None at all. None at all. Because uh, at a very later stage in life, I realized that my whole life I have led according to the wishes of my parents. The rest of my life was going to be led according to the wishes of my husband. And um, there was a time in life when I sat back and I actually thought, what about me? All that I'd read, all that I'd seen in the world, when do I find the time to actually prove to myself that this is what you've learnt and this part of what you've learnt is applicable in real life and this is what you can achieve on your own. This is... You want it to be your own self? Definitely. Not someone's daughter, not no. someone's wife? Not at all. You were 18 when this happened, weren't you? And you yes. decided you were going to pack your bags and go to Bombay? Yes. It was a shocker for my dad because I had, like I said, never projected any kind of ambition. I had never projected any kind of desire. So, in fact, even my school teacher used to say, when in a group discussion, everybody would say, uh, guess what I'd become? And uh, my teacher, school teacher, would pick uh, an accountant, a historian, an archaeologist from the group. And every time she came to me, she would say, you'd make a good housewife. <laughs> so, for me, it was like, okay, uh, all the stuff that had been suppressed inside myself. I said, it's time I let it out and did something. Because I knew I was meant to lead a special life. Nobody else around, I couldn't tell anyone uh, around me that, okay, this is what is supposed to happen. Listen to me. I'm supposed to make it big. And uh, in fact, uh, when I came to Bombay, and Zubin was a very dear friend, my husband. Except he I, wasn't your husband then? No. And I told him, you know, I'm going to make it big. This is the look he gave me. Yeah, right. He was Just, indulging you. Yeah, he was. My father was indulging me, my mother was indulging me, and so was Zubin. A lot of my other friends were too, because they did not believe. They're like, you have no clue what the real world is all about. I said, it doesn't matter. I'll still make it. But you took the bull straight by the horns. You got yourself a job of all places in McDonald's. Yeah. Was that fun or terrible? It was a learning experience, because here I was in Delhi throwing tantrums, the rich man's daughter, uh, telling people, do you know who I am? Suddenly, uh, cut to me wiping floors and cleaning dishes, and I, then I understood how difficult it was for my parents to earn each and every penny that they did. So McDonald's taught you respect for work? Respect for labor, respect for money, respect for time. Would you say it's the experience that made you? In a way, the whole experience of coming to Bombay, being on my own in a city, uh, going from audition to audition, being told, you're not good enough, you don't know how to act, you don't fit into the mold of an Indian housewife, sorry. These were the difficult days before Shobha Kapoor spotted you and before Bek Mazoola happened? Yes. Going uh, so they early in the morning at 6.30, catching a bus, going to the railway station, catching a train, going to Mahalakshmi station, walking to the studio, being there for the first auditions, sometimes without makeup because till date I don't have a clue of how to do makeup, uh, being rejected because either I'm too ugly or I don't know how to act, and uh, coming back home each evening and my mom asking me, okay, are you ready to give up? I'm like, no, it makes me more determined. You said you were a loner as a child. Does this make you a tougher person as well? In a way, I don't depend on people's compliments to keep going. I don't depend on uh, people. You don't even need them? You don't even like to hear them? It, I don't mind hearing them, but um, honestly speaking, I give a keen ear to people who criticize me. When I know that what they're saying is right, what they're saying needs to be worked upon, I actually listen, hear them out 
rather than hearing out somebody who sit across me and compliment me like for a good half an hour now, I would rather sit across a critic, hear what he has to say and if he makes sense, actually work on it. You know, you mentioned Zubin and the fact that he used to often wonder whether you were going to make it big and look at you and indulge you. At what point did Zubin stop being an old friend that you knew for ages and become the man that you were going to marry? About a year back. Just then? Yeah. We've been great friends. In fact, uh, throughout my struggle, if uh, anybody turned me down, I would relate the story to him. If, uh, you mean all your failed romances and crushes you confided in him? Everything. And the poor man would just sit and nod. Mm. You mean you had no idea that he no. actually loved you no at the time? No clue. Absolutely no clue. So you were inflicting torture on him? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. But uh, in fact, my dad spotted it before I did. My father spotted it. My father said, do you know he's actually in love with you? I'm like, are you crazy? He's a friend. And then my dad told me, do you know he's good looking? I said, are you mad? He's normal to look at. There's nothing good looking about him. But I'm glad that I didn't see, uh, I'm glad that I spent all those formative years uh, as Zubin's friend. Because today, uh, like he once said, that marriage hasn't ended the conversation in the relationship. We talk about everything under the sky. We have no inhibitions. Um, we know each other's follies, we know each other's uh, strengths, weaknesses, we everything. We can discuss anything under the sky. So your uh, marriage is successful because Zubin remains a friend first and a husband after that. Yes. And very honestly, I have been able to digest the success because of him. Now, two months ago, your first child was born and Zubin chose a very interesting, intriguing name with a lot of significance, I'm told. Yeah. Zor. Zor. Yeah. What is Actually, Zor, Zor is Zubin's uh, uncle's friend's name, but I quite liked the way it sounded because I intended on him being called Zor Zubin. It sounds quite powerful and nice. And uh, Zubin happened to be on a trip somewhere where he uh, chanced upon, um, I think, Britannic or something. And he found out that uh, Zor actually is the Jewish holy book, the Kabbalah. It's called Zor by the Jews. So I was like quite happy. I said, ah, look at destiny. What I ended up calling my son with a beautiful name. You know, in a sense, at a moment, you're in, at a crossroads. You're a wife, you're an actress, and you're a mother. How long can you continue as all three? As long as possible. In fact, I think I might add to it. What would be the addition? A, a writer. Um, that is the ambition. You mentioned it earlier as well. A writer, entrepreneur, anything. Anything, everything is possible under the sky. That's what I discovered when I left home at 18. As long as I'm determined, as long as I'm focused, and uh, as long as I'm willing, success will happen and continue happening. Good luck. Thank you. And thank you very much for a wonderful interview. Thanks, Karan.